Hello, and welcome to Living Arts. I'm your host, Jackie Suarez. Thank you for tuning in. Tonight, we're going to be speaking with Livia Strauss. She is the co-founder and director of the Hudson Valley Center for Contemporary Art. It's right here in Preakskill, and we're delighted to have her on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> I've been looking forward to seeing you tonight. You know, I've been a big fan of the museum for quite some time. I live up the block from it. And I think, more importantly, I guess, a lot of the, uh, the people that live close to it don't realize what a great place that is to come and visit. So what was it that inspired you to start the museum? So uh, it's a bit of a long story. <laughs> um, but uh, in about uh, 1999, there was an exhibition um, that pulled on works from the collection. It pulled mm -hmm. on some 50 works from the collection. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I, in our years of collecting, have always focused on very young artists or artists that are doing emerging, very experimental work, emerging mm -hmm. artists. Um, and we were approached by the University um, of Gainesville, the University of Florida Gainesville, to do an exhibition that was called um, uh, Inner Eye. And mm -hmm. it focused on works that we collected when the artists were young, regardless of whether the artists became successful or not. Okay. Um, that was our first experience with having a traveling exhibition mm -hmm. from the collection, which specifically went to educational venues. Mm -hmm. So the, mu the exhibition traveled for two and a half years only to university museums all along the East Coast mm -hmm. and ended at the Newberger Museum at SUNY uh, Purchase. Okay. And while that exhibition was on the road, uh, Mark and I would come and give lectures. And we would speak to people who were potential collectors, we would speak to college classes, we would speak to elementary school groups, mm -hmm. um, a whole variety of people that were coming in. And it was, um, it gave us a lot of insight in mm -hmm. terms of how the art could open a dialogue that really reached across all different branches of the community. Mm -hmm. And because the work wasn't um, obvious, wasn't overt, a lot of it was very challenging, mm -hmm. it led to very rich discussions. Right. When the collection came back, given mm -hmm. that we're collectors, there was no place to put the pieces that were coming back. Okay. So we were at a crossroads in terms of collecting because we had always lived with the art. Mm -hmm. So the decision was, do we put the art into storage where it doesn't do the artist any good and it doesn't do the public any good? Or do we do something that would really utilize the work and continue this educational initiative? Mm -hmm. And we started looking for different venues um, to um, have as an exhibition space mm -hmm. um, to not specifically show the collection, but really to highlight this um, very special way that art really enriches us as human beings. Mm -hmm. And um, we looked at several cities. We didn't want to be very far from where we live. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in Westchester, so we looked at one or two communities that we felt could really benefit from the educational programs. Mm -hmm. And where we could really help uh, the community itself uh, and the village or the city to really grow and to flourish. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the places we looked at was, of course, Peekskill. Right. And when we found the building in Peekskill, which was a plain building, which is exactly what we were looking for, mm -hmm. we wanted a place that would just highlight the art. We made the decision to um, try this initiative here. Mm -hmm. uh, we started working on the project in 2001. Okay and finally finished the project in 2004, opened our doors to the public in March of 2004. Mm -hmm. And that year, um, both hosted an exhibition. So the first exhibition was from the collection mm -hmm. because the collection had already gained a lot of um, um, a high profile in the arts community. So it was a way of our bringing a whole new population into Peekskill right. that didn't know about this area, which mm -hmm. for me is like God's country. It's the most beautiful geographic region. It is. So it was a way of really bringing a population in, in from Europe, from uh, the national community, from across the United States, and really having them introduced to the city of Peekskill and thereby having the city start to flourish in a different way. I just want to uh 
interject here for one moment. I want to just be clear or make it clear for our audience. When you say the collection, you're talking, these were works from your private collection. Correct. So that's how it started with the University of Gainesville. So it started to, with to the University, clear. yes, mm -hmm. of Gainesville okay. with the private collection. And the first exhibition at HVCCA, the Hudson Valley Center for Contemporary Art, was also from the collection. Okay. Um, and then afterwards, subsequently, actually that first year, we also launched something that we called the Peak Skill Project. Right. So that's an initiative of the HVCCA, but permits us to put art outside in the community, in businesses, along streets. Right, literally on the, the street. On the waterfront, <laughs> on the street. Anybody who comes to Peak Skill can go visit the library and they see the pedestrian shuffle mm -hmm. by Leon Reed, which seems to be a very popular image. Uh, they can see the pieces the on the waterfront. Over. Yeah, yes. it's all over the city. Mm -hmm. So that first year, we also launched the Peak Skill Project. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an initiative in 2004 that was called Ferry Go Round. It was done by the developer in the community, by Ginsburg Development. Okay. And they were going to, they hired a ferry to go to the different waterfront towns where they had developments mm -hmm. uh, going up. And they wanted each of the towns to do a special project. Oh, okay. And that year I had an intern working for me who had worked on, as an intern, on one of these public festivals. Mm -hmm. And I looked at her and I said, okay, I was going to wait until 2005, but we've got to launch Peak Skill Project this year. Mm -hmm. So the year we opened the museum, uh, because it is a not-for-profit public institution, it's not about the collection. Right. But the year we opened the exhibition at the museum, we also launched Peak Skill Project, which had all of these artists whom nobody had ever heard of, mm -hmm. who just wanted to have their work shown. We had over 120 artists. Wow. And quite a few of those artists now have landed wonderful galleries. We have um, a history in our 10, 000, uh, 10 years of having over 100 artists mm -hmm. uh, whose career has been launched at HVCCA and who now have gallery representation and doing very well. Wow. So that was the beginning of uh, this citywide festival that's really grown and flourished. You know, it's something that I guess distinguishes Peekskill from some of the other neighboring towns, and it's something that everyone that visits, um, you know, makes mention of some of the stuff that's down by the waterfront. Yeah. It's kind of all over, the, all over the place. It's all over the city, and it's then added course, something yeah. to the city for sure. Yeah, and then in 2009, when there was the quadricentennial. Of course, we also had a wonderful education program that mm -hmm. year because we launched the Tile Project. Right. So students were able to study the last 400-year history of the Hudson Valley mm -hmm. and the Dutch roots of the Hudson Valley and then create these beautiful murals and For those that are unfamiliar, what was the Tile uh, Project? So the Tile Project was um, an initiative done along with the Croger Centennial. I wanted students to be able to study and to really feel the history of the region, mm -hmm. both the Dutch settlements, the early Dutch settlements, as well as the rich history of Peekskill. I mean, you know, the fact that Peekskill housed the Underground Railroad, that many of the homes had these underground tunnels mm -hmm. uh, that were the escape route for the slaves coming through the area. And um, it was, you know, it was a chance to really highlight the history of the, of the area and of the city. But how do you teach students that so that they're really involved? Mm -hmm. So I came up with this idea of pulling on a lot of the historic images, pulling on some of the literature that was coming out as a result of the Quadricentennial. So uh, Russell, Russell Shorto's book and a book that was published specifically for students by the Dutch consulate. Mm -hmm. giving them a feel of the history of this region. Mm -hmm. And we took all of that information, and uh, Joanne Brody, who was my director of education at the time, and I kind of uh, became co-conspirators and put mm -hmm. together this very, very broad curriculum mm -hmm. uh, with images that then we were able to put on the road. So at that time, we involved over 50 communities mm -hmm. from the greater Hudson River region, scout groups, schools, over 600 students from Peekskill itself. Oh, wow. Who all produced, each student produced one tile mm -hmm. that reflected on a particular time or a particular image that grabbed them from mm -hmm. the history of this region. And they produced a Dutch style tile, which then was fired with help from um, the Westchester Arts Council and help from a lot of people in this area who had kilns mm -hmm. and then created this tile trail through the history of Peekskill, uh, through the city of Peekskill. 
and it looks that terrific. reflected on its history. It's beautiful, yeah, especially the benches. <laughs> the benches are beautiful. Yeah, they are very nice. Some of them are just at bus stops and, and yeah. various places. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that you do at the museum is the education and the public outreach. So you have something called the Family Art Day. Yes. So why don't you tell us, a little, if you know, a little bit about the programs that you have. Okay, so um, because we're a young institution, it's been really interesting that we've been able to kind of dream and develop programs and not mm -hmm. be uh, locked in to a particular curriculum or a particular program. Um, so there have been years that we've cooperated with the city of Peekskill, with the Peekskill school system, um, and worked with them in terms of their LEAP program, their extended day program. Right. When we worked with them, we had actually a 43-hour semester curriculum where the students came and they studied um, specific works in the museum exhibitions. Mm -hmm. Now, because the exhibitions always focus on art drawn from the international community, mm -hmm. the dialogue is very rich. And um, we are able to embellish and also fill in on areas of the school curriculum which are maybe not that expansive. Mm -hmm. Like the history curriculum is very difficult for the schools to address. And I still remember the first LEAP program we had was with fifth and sixth graders from the Hillcrest School. Mm -hmm. and why is it difficult, that, do you think? Why is it difficult to introduce history? Mm -hmm. I think because there's so much of an emphasis now on exams, on testing, oh, okay. and on the basics, that a lot of the enrichment classes are sacrificed, the literature classes, right. the history classes. And when you come into an exhibition, that particular exhibition had works by um, a, a Japanese artist who's focused very much on anime sculpture, but it involves studying the history of Japan, the relationship between Japan and the United States, uh, what the tensions were as a result of what happened during World War II, mm -hmm. what the history of Japanese art is, and how this new anime art is drawing from that history. And to really put together a picture as to this lovely art that seems so humorous, not really being so humorous. Right. That there's an underlying historic background that goes along with it. Or you take somebody like Anselm Kiefer, who had a major piece in that exhibition that was drawn out of Jewish mysticism. The students got so involved with it and brought in so much from their own background, from what's discussed in their churches, from the imagery that they have. But then they also had to understand what it was like for a contemporary artist, born in 1945, right at the end of World War II, coming out of the German community. What was he struggling with and what was the history of the time? So we discussed the Holocaust. We discussed a whole variety of issues. But that's what the art can do. It can open up this very broad bridge dialogue mm -hmm. between different communities. So that was one education program. The Tile Project was another. Now on a regular basis, we do these drop-in programs on weekends. Families can come and they can bring their children and it's family education programming. They, re they learn about one of the works in the exhibition mm -hmm. and then they do a project based on that work. Okay. So we have these drop-in Saturday programs. A year ago, we also launched something I'm very excited about, but it's, um, it's a mini semester for nursery schools in the area. Oh. And the students come to us once a week for a full week session. And they have to study the art. They, they have to study specific works. They have to learn about who the artist is. And the younger children, just they get it. Just like that. Really? I, was gonna, I would think that'd be difficult. It's fantastic. And they can build stories around it. We do this round robin story program. And then everything becomes art. If they have a snack, they have to create sculptures out of the food. Mm -hmm. So everything becomes like an aesthetic adventure. It's been very, very successful. We're looking forward now to working with people who are doing homeschooling. Mm -hmm. So the program is really expanding, and we try to respond really to what the needs are in the community. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping we'll be able to work in the future more than we have even till now. And we have in the past worked with the Youth Bureau and Peekskill, okay. and I'm looking to expand that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there are so many initiatives. There are so many possibilities. And our hope is that we'll be able to, for example, to build on some of the public works. So, you know, right across from Bowman Towers, there's a beautiful uh, park 
Right, with the light bulbs, kind of. So right mm -hmm. now there are two sculptures there. And the person who did those totems, Marco Remick, wants to come and work with the students. He wants to teach them, let them create their own sculptures mm -hmm. and let that park become a park where they can actually also display their own work. But on um, a controlled quality basis where they're using their creativity, mm -hmm. but they understand that they can create something that really is on a very high level that their creativity can really sing, and that's what we want. Some of the younger artists in the area. The younger artists. There is talent in Peekskill that is amazing. There was one year for Peekskill Project that we brought. Um, I was trying to identify some students in the Peekskill schools that were focused on graffiti art. You mm -hmm. know, how are they going around the community and doing stuff, but it's really good. Mm -hmm. And we brought in three students who were truly amazing. They were really talented. And that year we worked with um, the graphic design place in town uh, who worked with the students and they created designs that was then transferred onto vinyl mm -hmm. and that were placed on the rec bus. Um, the that, Peekskill the, trolley? The peak skill, not the Peekskill trolley. This was on the um, senior bus oh, okay. that goes around Peekskill, the van. Mm -hmm. And those vinyl transfers stayed on those vans for three years. The students were, I mean, they were so excited by it. It was such a great, a great thing. And I still remember one of the students bought his grandmother. She was standing in the parking lot at the museum when the bus <laughs> pulled up and she was just crying. You know, we all were. So do you find that some of these programs obviously are having a profound effect on the students in the area, but yeah. it's, is it more difficult to talk about contemporary art as opposed to something more traditional, or mm -hmm. does it open up? That Not much, for the that, students. That much more doors, I guess. Not for the students. I mean, some of the, um, depending on what the art is, uh, some of the greater difficulty is working with some of the senior artists, the older artists. Because I still remember we had one piece that was an electrified piece by a pretty well-known artist, Mona Hatoum. Mm -hmm. It was basically a large table with all of these different electric, electronic equipment on it, mm -hmm. toasters, broilers, but it was all wired. Mm -hmm. So if you touched anything, you were shocked. <laughs> and we had wires that were blocking people from going to it. And I still remember there was one, one of the uh, artists in town was there who does abstract painting. Mm -hmm. And he looked and he says, it's not art to me. Right? Okay. The students would never say that, the kids from the schools. They just, right. you know, they, they look at it, they get it. It's a challenge. Learn it. Um, but, you know, I looked at him. I said, well, what kind of art do you do? He said, well, I do abstract painting. I said, now, why is that art? Mm -hmm. Because at one time it wasn't. Right. So it's all about what's acceptable in any particular generation mm -hmm. and how people view it. So you've had a long-standing installation there, the laundromat. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. It so, seems to change a little bit over time. Not really. No. No, it stayed the same? It's, it's the only I thing felt that like it changes. Was a little the only thing that changes in it, uh, we bring in new magazines. Okay. Uh, we bring in new articles sometimes to put on the bulletin boards mm -hmm. um, because that piece is always supposed to be uh, current so that people feel like they're part of it. Okay. But it's, um, that was actually a piece that was specifically purchased for the museum because the museum's not a collecting institution. Mm -hmm. It's more of what's called a Kunsthalle. And because it doesn't collect, it gives us the freedom to always show new work. Mm -hmm. We don't have to show the permanent collection. So um, that piece was purchased, though, because we felt it would be an anchor piece for education programs and mm -hmm. because it's such a challenging work. Right. So Tomas Hirschhorn is Swiss, uh, but he lives in Paris. Mm -hmm. His work is always uh, very strongly political. It's about making political statements. Mm -hmm. uh, that work is called The Laundrette or My Beautiful Laundrette. Right. Um, it's based on the idea that everybody feels comfortable in a laundrette because everybody washes their clothing in a laundrette. I found out that wasn't quite true, not in Spain. They don't have <laughs> laundrettes, mm -hmm. um, but most countries do. And um, the work is a challenge that, um, if, if anybody has seen it, you know, you go into a room that looks like a laundromat, but mm -hmm. it's all tape. And it's all cardboard. Everything is made up. The it, washing machines are cardboard. It's got some disturbing dryers. imagery. Very disturbing imagery. There are six Im 16 images in it. Mm -hmm. Half of them are of the artist, Tomas Hirschhorn, doing these banal things, mm -hmm. like mopping up spilt milk. But it's all based on those type of slogans about how human beings handle tension. Mm -hmm. 
And then the other half, the other eight videos, are all downloaded from a website which had downloaded a documentary of the Rwandan genocide. So you have a laundromat, people sit in a laundromat, sometimes they're just kind of mesmerized, they're just watching the machines go round and round. Or zoning out. And you zone out. So how many things can you zone out on? And do we zone out on the pain that exists in the community? Or in the and, world. Or in the world. And he, you know, he has all these sayings on the world, on the walls that refer to everything that we've tried as human beings in terms of government systems, in terms of social systems, in terms of religion, patriarchy, capitalism, socialism, communism, you know, anything that we've tried, which always seems to fail. And I know that when some of the junior high school students come in, we also show them uh, segments from films. So especially films from the series The Terminator, mm -hmm. or RoboCop, this kind of challenge that human beings always have to um, deal with what the higher level of he being a human being should be mm -hmm. and how we struggle to reach that higher level. So Hirschhorn's piece is about that. The other piece that's about that is the Ice Mountain. That's by this artist, Volker de Jung, who's a very well-known Dutch artist now, who had his first showing mm -hmm. at HVCCA. But that piece called Mount Maslow is very important. It refers to Hamburger Hill, to mm -hmm. the film. Mm -hmm. And it's all about this need for human beings to always accumulate more power and never think about the consequences right. to other human beings of what it takes to, you know, to gather that power. Right. So um, that piece has been a centerpiece mm -hmm. for some programs with the high school, Peekskill High School. Mm -hmm. uh, there were several years that we worked with the second semester seniors mm -hmm. who already want kind of out of their regular school program. Right. So we have interns from the high school, but we also had this one program where the students came. They had to read segments of uh, some of the literature that informed Hirschhorn's approach to life. Mm -hmm. So they read sections from Nietzsche, from Hegel, very sophisticated readings. And then they had to come up with a project that was art-based that would call attention to the needs that exist within a community. Mm -hmm. And then they did a presentation for their school at the museum. So we've done um, a lot of the education programs are really geared to not having the one-shot education programs, but right. to really doing much more intensive education. And we do that on the adult level, too, when we do these panel discussions. Mm -hmm. And the panel discussions have really varied. Sometimes it's artists coming and speaking about their work, sometimes collectors coming. But two of the most fascinating programs we had, we had brought in um, an economist who deals with how to change community, mm -hmm. and then Ralph DeBart, who had worked extensively in Peekskill when Peekskill was to, trying to develop itself as the Soho of the North. Yes. And two other speakers, uh, Joyce Pomeroy Schwartz, who was also involved with Peekskill, talking about how a community can develop a vision which makes it a very unique community that bring people to the community to kind of understand it and admire it. So we've had that flexibility of doing that, which has been just amazing. Well, I think just in the time that I've been in Peekskill, it's always been kind of an artist community. But I think definitely the, the establishment of the museum has, you know, kind of propelled Peekskill and, you know, as far, and, you know, in the art scene, as far as people coming here and looking at it as kind of an art destination. Yeah. And um, definitely the outreach programs you have are wonderful because it's almost as if you're like a teaching museum in a lot of ways, not like, you know, your standard um, museum that you would just go to because everything is changing and you have all these various programs. Right. So right now we have, what are some of the current exhibitions that you have? So the current exhibition is Art at the Core, mm -hmm. um, which is, um, it was a very challenging exhibition to do um, because the goal was to choose works that have very strong narrative, but then of course, all works, all artworks have a narrative, but also to choose works that had some sort of a technology basis mm -hmm. because so many artists today are working specifically with technology. Mm -hmm. So somebody like Harun Mirza, who's a British artist who actually represented Britain in their Biennale, what was it, uh, I think four years ago, mm -hmm. um, doing a piece called uh, TV Heist which is all of this, uh, you know, technologic equipment kind of 
uh, blasting in and you're watching a TV just with these kind of images of mm -hmm. domesticity. But uh, part of what you're really looking at is also this kind of landing, you know, uh, platform mm -hmm. for the aliens to come in and to steal our culture. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of in a, a nutshell what he's um, aiming for, along with a piece that we have now that I'm calling a longer term installation, which was done by our last artist in re residence. Um, so Dan, uh, Daniel Phillips is, uh, I think, a wonderful artist, but he lived in Peekskill for three and a half months mm -hmm. and did this wonderful series of uh, videos that are actually stop, uh, they're like stop action stills. Mm -hmm. um, he did a documentary basically of the um, cemetery that belongs to the convent of St. Mary's, Saint Mary's at the top yes. of the mountain. Mm -hmm. That cemetery is supposed to be moved because the property is being sold to developers. Oh. And the number of nuns is also decreasing. So mm. that cemetery is going to be moved to the Connecticut headquarters. So he documented that cemetery. And then he also documented Sandy hitting the peaks of the waterfront. Sandy, yeah. So he actually had cameras tied to the trees. And he documented the, you know, the whole waterfront being covered all of a sudden. It's there. And the, you see the water just rising, and then all of a sudden everything disappears. So he built an igloo in the museum that's all reconstituted from reconstituted bricks mm -hmm. of buildings that have come down in Peekskill mm -hmm. and old wood. And he's got his uh, videos projected in there. So Daniel actually was the first of the um, artists in residence that we've had that was actually an American artist. So you're in hot pursuit of another one. So now it looks we're like, are pursuing you, are another you... one. But usually our artists in residence have been from the international community. Mm -hmm. So there's a different dialogue that's introduced within the art community in Peekskill. Mm -hmm. uh, we have certain requirements of the artists in residence. They have to produce work that's based on their impressions of living in this community and in this geographic region. And um, they also have to go out and lecture. They have to and kind of interact with the community. dialogue with the community. Uh, they do presentations for our artist club. We have a group of artists that meet monthly in uh, the museum and do cross critiques of their work. One or two artists every month get their works critiqued. So we'll look forward to meeting the new artists that you have. You know, yes. unfortunately we've run out of time, uh -huh. but I guess, you know, one of the main reasons or the most important reason that I, I wanted to have you on the show is because people don't realize just all the good things that are happening in the museum and what a great asset it is to the community. So I want to thank, thank you, you for that. Thank and all you. the hard and work that you do. I hope they all check the website. All of the information is on there. So what, you know, where can they find it. you on the web? The best thing is to go to www.hvcca.org. Okay. Um, so we have here Olivia Strauss. She is the co-founder and director of the museum. And I'm Jackie Suarez, your host. And we are out of time for now. So definitely like us on Facebook. Definitely go see the museum. Visit. It's a great experience. It's great for the family. Um, and you can, all the hours and what's showing there now, you can get all that information from the website and I think you're, they're also on Facebook. So we're going to say goodbye for now. Thank you and see you soon. Peace.